uh, new people for us. And um, I hope you guys feel super welcome. Um, on the back little flyer uh, that we gave you the little bulletin, um, where the lyrics are, there's a QR code. And that QR code will lead you to um, a page and kind of tell us a little bit more about our church, but also it'll lead to a little registration place so we can learn your name and get to know you a little bit. And our ultimate goal is to remember that uh, God brought you here because he's trying to connect with you. He wants to connect with you on a, on not only a deeper level, but a, a level that affects your entire life and leads you into eternity with them in heaven. And uh, we're all on that same journey, and we help each other on that journey. So if you'd uh, give us your name and a way to contact you, we would uh, join you with that, and it will be a privilege. And uh, this is a very safe church. It's a very nice church. People are very kind, generous, and open. And so I can say that from my own personal experience. Um, so if you follow that QR code, you'll, you'll see that. Um, my, my wife absolutely adores Christmas. She's a Filipino. I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, Christmas is not for the month of December for Filipinos. Uh, Christmas are the bird months, September, October, November, December. <laughs> and um, we, had, we had our Christmas tree up, I believe, the first of September. And, um, and our neighbors just absolutely love us for that. Um, as we live in a condo, so our lights flash. And, and so they, they get a good dose of Christmas all year. They think it's all year round. I know that the condo, are you guys are the Christmas couple, right? Yeah, we are. <laughs> we love Christmas. Yeah. Uh, we play Christmas chorus, you know, songs all year. And um, yeah, that's just the way it is. And, um, and in that, though, uh, my wife, she loves looking at cities that know how to celebrate Christmas. And so there's a lot of, like, Germany has Christmas markets, and London does all their thing, and the Philippines, they also just put lights everywhere. So a lot of cities in the world just do big, big things, um, invest a lot. It's, it is very pretty. And here in the United States, we don't do as much, but, you know, we make some worth an effort. But a lot of times, what we associate Christmas with, the happiness of Christmas, is what we're going to get, right? Especially your kids, or what you're going to do. And, and it's all positive things. It's all big things. And all of those are very good. We appreciate, we adore all those things. It adds for us to remember who Jesus is in a very positive way. But that's so far from the first Christmas. So far from how this whole thing started. I guess, I, I guess in a sense it's not because you had the angels, right? They came, and that was a humongous display. And then you had the wise men come, and that was a, a, a quite an announcement. But for Jesus and the simple shepherds, it was very humble. It's very humble. And so I'd like to read here for uh, the, just the, to begin the season. For those of you who didn't start in September, I'll try to catch you guys up where the rest of us are. Um, and I'll just read the first a couple of verses of Luke, the birth of Jesus. And what I want to bring to your attention is the, the humility of it, the humility, the smallness of it, um, the, the challenges of it, the difficulties of it. And here it begins. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She gave him, uh, she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And so the, the story that we have seen played out, many of us have seen played out over and over, is Joseph and Mary arriving on the donkey, and they go to the different uh, motels, and every innkeeper comes out and says, no, there's no room, and they have to go on to the next one. And, and that's, the, uh, that's the narrative that we have all the way through. It's a very true narrative. And finally, somebody shows up and says, I don't have any room. 
but I see what you're going through. My heart goes out to you. What I can do, though, is I can offer you some shelter in this stable, where along with everything else. And so Mary puts Jesus down into the manger where the cows and the goats and sheep would be from, and probably some hay and straw in there, and then that's, that's the very humble beginning of it all. I think a lot of times we come into Christmas with great expectation, and we should, but at the same time, we need to remember that Christmas is also a time of fear. It is also a time of shame. It is also a time of suffering. That's who Jesus came to. Jesus did not come with the flashing lights. He did not come to the kings and to the, the uh, magazine covers. He came to the poor. He came in to the, the very uh, least expected place. And it's important for us as followers of Jesus to look for Jesus and to bring Jesus into those least expected places and to look for those who are suffering, those who are having a hard time, those who need some comfort, those who need a friend. That's the role of a Christian in the time of Christmas is to bring Jesus peace, bring Jesus joy uh, to people, to identify. And I think as long as we remember who Jesus is and how he lived his life, that's a natural part of how we would live our lives and reaching out to those who are suffering. When I grew up, um, we uh, had shipped a bunch of things when my parents were living in the capital of Brazil, Brazilia. And uh, one of the things we shipped when we were coming back to the United States for a short time in the United States was my bicycle and a bunch of other things. And so um, they let us know that your, your packages have arrived, your freight has arrived in the United States. And I was so excited because my bicycle was in that crate. And so we go and we get the crate and we notice a lot of things are missing in our crate. And uh, that's just part of life. I know a lot of us get all upset when we see people stealing things uh, like we do. But I'll tell you what, that is a drop in the ocean compared to what custom services do around the world. Oh, uh, they steal. I we wish they only stole as little as they steal here, but it's just absolutely insane. And my dad is a very nice man, very kind man, very patient man. And, and what he would do, he was just, just plain dumb. He's, oh, you know, so the, the bike is in here. You know, where would the bike be? You know, and then, well, we'll look for it. Okay, you know, and then a couple of days later, we would go back and at once the bicycle that didn't arrive, you know, well, knowing very well that that and our tennis shoes and everything else that was good was gone. And oh no, we haven't found it yet. I don't know where it got lost. And then my dad would go back, and I'd go with him every time to the customs office. And oh no, we haven't found it yet. And we just did this repeatedly. And I enjoyed it because you'd kind of see them trying to you know, squeeze out of it, warm out of it. And um, but we got to know one of the guys at the desk there, the customs office. He actually was a teenager, and his name was Miguel. And uh, Miguel and uh, my dad just started talking more and. and doing conversations, and, and it got time for around Christmas time, it's about six months later, about Christmas time comes around, and um, my dad asked Miguel, you know, where are you going to celebrate Christmas? And Miguel says, oh, I've never celebrated Christmas before. He says, no, no, my parents, they belong to this cult, and uh, we, we don't believe in celebrating Christmas. I'm like, oh, no, that's terrible. Said, would you like to celebrate Christmas sometime? He says, yes, I really would, but I, I, don't, I don't really know anybody. And my dad said, well, you should come to our house next Christmas, and enjoy a Christmas dinner with us. It'd be wonderful to have it. My dad gave me you know, our address like he didn't have and everything. And, and, um, and it wasn't very long after that that somehow, we're actually, the bike shows up, the tennis shoe shows up, and everything else shows up. And we we're all happy. We got everything. And, and it worked. And so we were all ready for the And so um, that Christmas comes. We're all sitting around the dinner table wondering where, when Big going to show up. He never showed up. And I uh, was like, well, okay, that's just the way it is. You know, it's okay, it's too bad, but on we go. And then an entire year goes by, and we're sitting down for Christmas dinner, and there's a knock at the door. We have no clue who would be there. And um, I go to the door um, and open it, and there's Miguel standing there. And I go, Miguel, wow, well, great to see you. You know, I didn't know you'd be here. And he's like, well, what do you mean? You didn't know you're the one who invited me. And so uh, we have them sit down at the table, and we're all like wanting to ask, why are you a year late? But you don't want to just come right out, right? <laughs> you know, it is kind of weird, though, is it going to be a year late? And so somehow or another, the conversation did come around to find out why he was a year late. And what he told us was, 
that when he was invited, he was invited to our house next Christmas. Well, next would be not this one, the one after that. And so you still wonder, when you say next, does that mean this is next? Well, I can put this here, right? If I said, I'm going to go to your house next Wednesday, are you really thinking I'm going to go, you know, 10 days? You know what I mean? What, what, I don't know. But anyways, that's how he showed up. And the funny thing about, uh, that I remember about Miguel was, in Brazil, uh, no, I don't think anywhere in the world, maybe England, they don't know what fruitcake is. And my mother loved fruitcake, and I don't know if you guys know a lot about fruitcake, but the, the longer a fruitcake sits somewhere, um, the better it is. So like our fruitcake was really good because it was like 42 years old. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember passing her around and oh, this is a, a wonderful American tradition to eat this fruitcake. And he's all excited. You know? And I remember him cutting a piece, you know, and then my dad says, yes. It's 42 years old. And I, and I can remember his whole face just dropped. You know? <laughs> I don't know what that means, you know. And he politely passed it on. And, um, and later on, you know, we got to know him a little bit better. And by the way, you know, he had a lot of kind of crazy things about him. Um, one time, he told us that he wasn't feeling very well. He was kind of worried. And by this time, he started coming to church for a little bit and um, went to the doctor. Uh, he didn't really trust real doctors. He went to uh, more of a, a different kind of doctor. And the doctor diagnosed his problem. And what this doctor uh, diagnosed it as was that his tongue was not getting enough sunlight. And so <laughs> every once in a while, we would meet with Miguel, you know, in a basketball game or outside or something. And he's sitting out there with his tongue sticking out, letting, getting some sun rays on that thing. We were, are you feeling better, Miguel? You know, just, you know, just helping? You know. We did those kinds of things. Well, um, he started, he came, got to know the Lord, and everything's going real well. He's a part of a youth group, everything's going super well. When one night in one of our youth groups, my mother decided to tell her story about how she had stolen uh, three bricks from a school construction site across the street from her when she was a little girl. She wanted to make a house for her dolls, and she had snuck over there and stole three bricks. And her point was that we need to be very honest when we're followers of Jesus, and we need to account for the things that we have done wrong, the sins we've committed, and to make up for those. And she told the story how, you know, 10, 15 years later, she felt convicted that she had stolen these bricks from the schoolyard. She wrote a letter uh, to the principal at that school and enclosed a check for the bricks to cover the cost of the bricks. And this principal had written a letter back thanking her for her sensitivity, but that they would probably black either give her the bricks and I'm sure that they broke far more bricks than what she took and not to worry about it. And he sent the check back. And, and then my mother felt peace in her heart because uh, she had done what she could to make the situation right. Well, that's what my mother's intention was that people would be sensitive, you know, that we'd be very honest and make up. Well, little did she think that we had a customs worker there. And Miguel raised his hand, well, you know, I, I stole something once, <laughs> you know, and so he confessed his sin, and the whole youth group is, uh, Miguel, that's, that's wonderful, the Lord forgives you, you're forgiven, Miguel, it's okay. Well, you know, there was another time when I stole something, <laughs> oh, okay, well, go right ahead, Miguel, and he confesses to the other lady who stole it. Well, you know, the Lord is wonderful, right, he died on the cross, forgives for all his sins, and you know, you know, who would have thought he thought of another thing gets stolen? And so now you would think, you know, the, the family of God would be very nice about it, but things started getting a little testy. <laughs> really, another thing. You know, well, now he's on a rampage, right? He's just going. You know, the Lord really could fix it up. He shared all these things and stolen it. Oh, by the end, I mean, the whole youth was furious at him. You know, <laughs> oh my God, no wonder the world's so corrupt. People like you and it, you're a horrible person. was able to, to bring it back uh, somehow from that. And uh, Miguel, honestly, I, I would not doubt if someday he just showed up in our church. Uh, because he uh, he travels the world now. He just spent two weeks in Havana. And does a lot of great things. Has a good life. And um, we have a very tight youth group uh, from my childhood. And we still talk a lot. Nobody sees this the way I do. They all disagree with me. But I'm going to share what my side of the story is. 
Ironically, Miguel went to work for the government, because he qualified as being corrupt, and uh, <laughs> you're not going to believe what his job is in the government. He's the one that trains the new congressman how to write bills, how to get things from government, and everything like that. Makes sense to me, right? There you go. It's where it goes, bro. Thanks, you know. It's unnatural. And uh, he's written books, you know, for the government, how to do this. He's very well known. He's got a YouTube station and everything. Does everybody know how to do this? But I. I I can't say that I know what his life is like now. I just know he lives a very wealthy life, of course. <laughs> but on the other side of that, what I don't know is I do see a life that was completely transformed and changed by Jesus. And he's very generous now, and he's uh, has a wonderful family man, all these good things. And it causes me to remind myself what the importance of Christmas is. Is that when you're hurting, that's where Jesus should be. And that's what we should bring into the situation. And I think all of us, we're going to come into contact with people who are having a difficult time, or have experienced a recent loss, something like that. It's not what we do, but it's what God is doing on his side. How God is reaching people, what God wants to say. He uses us, he uses our voices, he uses our presence to share his word with others. And that's our role, is to share that and keep that going. I have here a, a story that I wanted to share with you. Um, I had an uncle that was a, a very good pastor, and um, he, uh, he, he wrote a lot of his sermons out. I have some of them, and uh, I got this from him, my Uncle C.W., and it's a story he, he told, and uh, it's been a while, and you'll kind of see that in the nature of the story, uh, but it's, it's just as true, it's, it's kind of, before that reason, it's kind of endearing. Uh, the story is called A New Pair of Shoes.